Welcome. Technical, what is it, Murphy's Law? Yeah. <laughs> My name is Dr. Ball. I'm a professor of history in the social science division. I want to welcome you here. This is sponsored basically by CFI, the members right there. They're a great group here that they're promoting science and reason and freedom of inquiry. And Dr. Sherman said, make his introduction short, so I will. He's had a distinguished career as a founding publisher of Skeptic Magazine, editor of Skeptic.com. He's a monthly columnist for Scientific American, and we're very excited to have him here. His latest book is really subtle like crazy. It's The Believing Brain, From Ghosts and Gods to Politics and Conspiracies, How We Construct Beliefs and Reinforce Them as Truths. And we should have some books available to sell eventually down here before we're through. Another glitch, evidently. But, uh, oh, they're <laughs> up there. Okay. Hey, Jerry, great. There's some books right there. Uh, and so, without further ado, let me All bring right. you Dr. Michael Schroeder. Yeah. Thank you. Thank so you, much. sir. Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. Thanks for your patience. We were here an hour and a half ago, tested everything, worked great, and then the gods struck. <laughs> you see, maybe I shouldn't be so skeptical. <laughs> so. Uh, and by the way, those of you standing in the back, there are some seats down here if you want to make your way down. It looks like there's some there. You don't have to stand. I don't mind. Uh, but so I'm the publisher of this magazine, Skeptic Magazine. looks like this. It's the quarterly publication. You can actually still find paper magazines. I know. It's hard to believe. Uh, it's also available digitally. But each one has a particular theme to it. So the Skeptic Society is a 501c3 nonprofit science education organization devoted to investigating claims of the paranormal, pseudoscience, fringe groups, and cults. And claims of all kinds between good science, junk science, bad science, voodoo science, pathological science, non-science, and plain old nonsense. <laughs> Thank you. That's the first time I've ever done that. No. And, uh, and unless you've been abducted by aliens and been on Mars for the last few decades, you know there's a lot of it out there. Nonsense. Our job is to debunk the bunk. Let's face it, there's a lot of bunk to be debunked. But more importantly, we're interested in why people believe things. Not just weird things, but anything. So each particular theme uh, uh, issue has a theme to it. So for example, uh, if you, uh, if you uh, look at this one up here, the future of intelligence, are people getting smarter or dumber? Well, I'm from Los Angeles, so I have an opinion about this myself. <laughs> but it turns out people are getting smarter. IQ scores are going up about three points every 10 years. It's quite uh, amazing. Generationally speaking, people are getting better at abstract reasoning which I think has to do with the um, uh, expanded uh, educational levels, literacy, reading novels, seeing televi watching television, movies, and just thinking abstractly, multitasking. Uh, we did one on um, uh, artificial intelligence. When will computers achieve human level intelligence? And we concluded that we're five years away and always will be. <laughs> Uh, we did about 9-11 conspiracy theories. Was 9-11 a conspiracy? Yes, it was. By definition, 19 members of Al-Qaeda plotting flight planes in, into buildings without telling us ahead of time constitutes a conspiracy. <laughs> but the 9-11 truthers, they think it was an inside job by the Bush administration. You know how we know that the federal government did not orchestrate 9-11? Because it worked. <laughs> <laughs> We've done a lot on global climate change, global warming. Are you a global warming skeptic or are you skeptical of the global warming skeptics? See, this is a, an, an indication of the problem of defining skepticism. Are you skeptical of a claim or the skeptics of the claim, which makes you a believer? What does it mean to be a skeptic? What does it mean to be a believer? Science is what we're doing. Science, the scientific method is the best way to understand whether a claim is true or false. Anyway, none, none of that really matters because the world's going to end in 2012, which is this year. <laughs> so you have until December 21st, so eat, drink, and be merry for the end is nigh. <laughs> so um, we actually, oh no, let's see. Uh, it looks like we're frozen again. Uh, yep, my slides are not advancing. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm just going to talk. <laughs> With this as my backdrop, is that all right? So you might want to do the spot while I, I could stand here, I guess. <laughs> uh, 
All right, so let me just tell you a little bit about the new book, The Believing Brain. And uh, my first book was uh, Why People Believe Weird Things. Uh, in this book, I was interested in why people believe anything, full stop. Because that's the problem. It's not that uh, <laughs> we have a skeptical dog. <laughs> Let's see if this is actually going to work. Uh, new. It looks like maybe it's a really, really, really slow. It's like a dial-up connection. There we go. I don't know if you can read that. It says, psychic fair canceled due to unforeseen circumstances. <laughs> and uh, let's see. Boy, this is like super slow. This is like the old dial-up from the early 90s. There we go. Let's see if I can get my little video clip to work. This is a, an example of the need for science education. This is a conversation overheard. Well, I really like that. So, yeah, those tusks, that's the problem. <laughs> I told you I'm from LA, right? So, um, it looks like these slides are going to take like 30 seconds to go from one slide once I hit the transition button. So, I don't know if it's going to be, because I go pretty rapid fire here. Uh, but the point is that in science, we're skeptical, uh, and that scientists are skeptical. All that means is that uh, we don't believe until your claims have some evidence to them. Uh, and so the null hypothesis, as it's called, uh, is the assumption we make, like here in science, we search for natural explanations for natural phenomena. I mean, what's more likely, that aliens traverse the vast distances of interstellar space and landed in Farmer Bob's Field in Parker Brush, Kansas, to make a crop circle that says skeptic.com as a promotion of our webpage, or somebody with Photoshop made a fake photo? Or that... <laughs> At the speed of stagecoach change. <laughs> uh, I don't really think this is going to work. I think I'm just going to abandon the, uh, the PowerPoint thing and just talk. Anyway, as I was. So, um, okay, so here's the thing. Here's how science works. Uh, we assume that your claim is not true until proven otherwise. So skeptic, skepticism is the base uh, uh, level. So if you claim you have a cure for AIDS or cancer or whatever, we say, that's nice. Uh, what's your proof? Show us your evidence. And tell them we're going to be skeptical. You think that aliens have visited Earth or that there's a Bigfoot up in the hinterlands of Canada. That's nice. Where's the body? So the burden of proof is not on the skeptics to disprove your claim because everybody's got a claim. Any of them could be true. The burden of proof is on you, the claimant, to prove that the claim is true by providing evidence. So we apply this principle to all claims. And so in the believing brain, what I'm trying to understand is how we form these beliefs in the first place and why it is that our natural inclination is just to believe whatever we're told and that the scientific way of doing it is counterintuitive. It doesn't. It isn't how we normally operate. So take just take an example of a of a of a newsworthy um, claim that autism is caused by vaccinations given to young children. Uh, you've heard this, and, and it's a it's a big it's a big issue because a lot of parents are no longer getting their children vaccinated because they're afraid that this will cause uh, their children to become autistic. How did this happen? Well, it's because our brains are, are wired up to really notice salient, immediate, emotionally charged anecdotes. So one day, mom takes her little kid, little Johnny, little Mary to the doctor to get vaccinated. And then like a month later, starts acting a little strange, takes her to the doctor. There's a diagnosis of autism. And so she thinks, huh, autism? What's the last thing I did? Oh, that vaccination thing, right? So the anecdote, connecting A to B, is what seems to be uh, how our brains work. We really pay attention to those kinds of connections, the ones that particularly have emotional value to us. The problem is, is that there may be a connection. There may not be a connection. Because randomness and accidental, coincidental connections between things are pervasive through the world. So we don't know if it's that or something else. The only way to know is to actually do a test 
do some kind of epidemiological study to really look at the difference between those. It was like the, the big silicon breast implant controversy in the 1990s where Dow Corning was sued uh, hundreds of times by uh, people that had had uh, silicon breast implants and that had had these uh, degenerative tissue diseases, these sort of autoimmune diseases. And I remember when this happened, uh, lawyers were running ads in the LA Times, the New York Times, Wall Street Journal. If you have any of the following symptoms and you have silicon breast implants, contact us, you may have a, a financial reward coming. And, and the symptoms were just a laundry list of things, you know, anxiety, weight loss, weight gain, sleep problems, too much sleep, pretty much anything that any of us have just through daily living. And you happen to also have silicon breast implants, you could sue Dow Corning and get money. So of course, they had tons of data, lots of people called. The problem was there was no connection at all. So you have two populations that just by chance overlap. It could have been any other population. It's just that's the one that got media attention. And then the whole thing was thrown out and Dal Corning was found completely innocent of all those charges and the banning on silicon breast implants turned out to be a non-event. It was not necessary at all. But that's kind of how our brains work, right? So we find connections between things. We assume that they're true until proven otherwise, but the problem with that is that's what gets us into trouble. Uh, so the only way to tell is to actually do some sort of scientific test like that. So I go through a whole a series of claims and this is what we do at Skeptic is that we <laughs> We look at different claims that come to us, like global climate change, for example. I was skeptical of a lot of this through the 90s and the early 2000s. Global climate change, global warming is caused by humans. Uh, it's real and caused by humans and so on. And uh, until the data set really started coming in, data sets started sort of being coordinated between each other in a fairly consistent way, it wasn't clear to me. And here again, we have a problem that our brains are wired up for short-term thinking, as I mentioned salient immediate events. So things like evolution, climate change, you don't see any of this stuff happening. Trends that happen over thousands of years or tens of thousands of years or millions of years, you don't see it. Climate, climate, global warming, it was cold yesterday. What are you talking about global warming? I wish there was global warming, my friends in Canada tell me, <laughs> right? But that's not how we interpret long-term trends. You have to look at the overall data set and how far it out it's going over thousands of years, not what happened yesterday. There's the weather that happened yesterday, there's the climate, that's a much long-term thing. Same thing with why so many people have trouble understanding evolutionary theory. Um, in addition to the religious objections to it, which I'll come back to in a minute, uh, there's just the idea is I don't see species changing. They look fixed to me. It, because on a human time scale, they are fixed. Species don't change, except on the, a bacterial grade level. AIDS virus has evolved, for example. But people don't see dogs becoming something else, right? They, they're just dogs. Actually, if you lived 200 years, you would have seen about two dozen species of dogs become about 200 species of dogs since about the 1850s. That's quite a bit of change. Of course, there's still dogs, but you can still see that change. But even that's too short for us to see. So our brains are geared up for these sort of middle levels of change and time and causality that makes it harder for us to see uh, these long-term things. So this is what leads to some of these sort of politically charged controversies. Now, it's interesting to me that the climate change example is one so geared to politics. So this tells us that beliefs are not just based on facts and data and our rational understanding of them. It tells us that they're also tied up in and our other commitments to social groups, like our political party that we belong to, the religion that we belong to, and so on. So conservatives are supposed to be skeptical of climate change, and liberals are supposed to accept it. That is just so weird. I mean, how can that be? E either it's getting warmer or it's not. Either it's human caused or it's not. This should just be a simple empirical question. But you can see that it's so loaded with political baggage that there's something else going on there, right? That our beliefs, are not just based on uh, our assessment of the data. So this is the enlightenment vision of humanity, that humans are rational calculators and we can make rational decisions, freely chosen and so on. None of that turns out to be true, that we're very emotional primates. We're social primates. We're social hierarchical primates. We make a commitment to our group and then we stick to that commitment. This is why people vote along party lines. 
regardless of the issues. It doesn't really matter what the issues are. This election, uh, you know, it's oil, you know, gas, immigration, abortion. The last election, it was a bunch of other uh, issues that people cared about. It doesn't matter what the issues are. You're, you're a Democrat, you're supposed to vote Democrat. If you change your mind, you're a flip-flopper. <laughs> Remember John Kerry, right? You're a flip-flopper. You know, and, 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 and if you're Mitt Romney, if you're not conservative enough, boy, oh boy, we may not vote for you. Remember what he said in response to that? I'm severely conservative. <laughs> Ooh, severely conservative. I am such a good group member, you can count on me. The reason we're that way is because we evolved in these tiny bands of hunter-gatherers of a couple dozen to a couple hundred people where everybody is either related to one another or knows one another intimately. To this extent, there's this magic number called 150, the magic number 150. It's the number of people that most of us know fairly well. If I looked in your address book from 20 years ago or your Facebook page today, I would find on average for everybody in the room, it would come out to about 150 friends or people that we know fairly well. That's about the number of people you can keep track in your brain of relationships. Some people are better at that. Politicians are really good. Somebody like Clinton, you know, knew like a thousand and fifty people. You know, I'll feel your pain. <laughs> and uh, I did not have sexual relations with that one. <laughs> Ms. <Lewis. laughs> uh, but some of us are less well at that. We only know a few people, right? But, but that level of int intimacy allows us to determine who we should trust and who we shouldn't trust. So in the long evolutionary history of our species, we evolved a moral system in which the rule of thumb is be nice to your fellow kin and kind and people you know and be very skeptical and cautious and xenophobic about people in other groups because they're dangerous. And we now know from archaeological data from the past, anthropological data from current hunter-gatherer societies and other forms of data that in-group fighting and xenophobia has been with us throughout the ages. We are naturally xenophobic and there's a good reason for that. The good reason is those other people in that other tribe really are dangerous. They may kill us. So be cautious. So this explains our race, sort of our inherent racist, xenophobic feelings we have. They bubble up from millennia past, from our ancient uh, programs that are, are, were there for a good reason, but not. So this goes a long way to explain why, why politics are so divisive. Because the guys in the other tribe, the other party, they're not just wrong you got the wrong data set on abortion, or you, you got the wrong facts about climate change. No, no. They're righteously wrong. They're bad wrong. They're evil doers. They're, they're dangerous. You hear this in the rhetoric of conservatives talking about liberals and, and vice versa. And you know what conser how liberals think of conservatives as a, you know, a bunch of like Hummer driving, gun toting, constitution waving, you know, shoe stomping, Bible thumping, blowhards that, you know, have no tolerance for anybody, greed and God, that's all they care about. And you know what conservatives think of liberals, right? A bunch of wishy-washy, mamby-pamby, bottom water drinking, tree hugging, whale saving, mamby-pamby bedwetters, right? I mean, it, it's, <laughs> it's not that they're wrong, it's just that, I mean, they're really bad. The reason for that is because of this tribal instincts that we have, that, that you know, we really need to circle the wagon and stick together as a band of brothers. We know from research on soldiers that fight in wars, when you ask them, why do you fight? I mean, what, what's going through you? I mean, are, you, are you fighting for freedom and liberty to bring democracy to Iraq and Afghanistan? No, they're fighting to protect the guy standing next to them. It's the band of brothers. Like, that's who soldiers care about. They care about the other guys in the group. They're not thinking about politics and flag and honor and tradition and democracy and ideology and liberty. They're not thinking about that, right? Like our brains are geared for these immediate events, right? So this explains why politics is so divisive and religion also. The reason is because religion is also divided up like that. We're tribal in the sense that what your religion does is it binds you as a, as a cohesive group. It reinforces the values and the morals that we hold, our group. And those guys over there across the river, eh, I don't know. Yeah, they, they believe that other goofy stuff. Not so sure we should trust them. Now we don't trust them for other reasons because they probably really are dangerous, regardless of their beliefs. But then the beliefs are proxies for that. 
Circle the wagons, you know, you believe this. This is why religion has become so divisive for the same reason that political parties are. We think that religions and politics evolved um, as a way of reinforcing the rules uh, and in, in encouraging people to be cooperative and nice as these populations began to get larger. So just think back. So those hunter-gatherer ba hunter bands of a couple dozen to a couple hundred people, about three to 5,000 years ago, they began to coalesce into chiefdoms and states and empires of thousands, tens of thousands, millions of people. To that extent, you don't, you're not related to hardly anybody. You don't know hardly anybody. So there's too much opportunity for free riding and cheating the system, and that does go on. So politics, government evolved as a way of saying, all right, these are the rules. Here they are. Everybody obeys them, and here's the penalties if you don't. And they were pretty harsh before the modern times. <laughs> and if you think you got away with it anyway because no one was watching, actually there is somebody watching. There's an invisible man in the sky who sees all and knows all, and he knows everything, and it will all be settled in the next life. Don't sin. Right? Government and religion both arose about the same time, three to 5,000 years ago, as a way of basically telling people in the, these huge populations, there's too much backbiting, fighting, cheating going on. We need to do something, right? We need to put a heavy hand down. So your commitment to your party, your commitment to your religious beliefs, this is a signal. It's a social signal to your fellow group members. You can count on me. I'm a trustworthy person, really. I'm good. You see me there every uh, every Sunday in the pews or Fridays, uh, you know, at the Shabbat or wearing the yarmulke or not eating meat or whatever the rituals are. It doesn't matter what the rituals are. It's the doing of the rituals that signals to your fellow group members, you can count on me. I'm a reliable guy. And this is where our morality comes from. So belief in politics, belief in religion is all tied up in how our brains are wired up. Now, in the believing brain, I show how, in fact, we're not really aware of any of that. Basically, we just feel like we're right. And we are right. And you know how I know? Because I know I'm right. <laughs> and I know you know that you think you're right. And I know that you know that I think I'm right. And we end up in this back and forth meta meta thing that's called mind reading. We know that there are these differences. But our brains trick us through something called the confirmation bias where you look for and find confirming evidence for what you already believe, and you ignore the disconfirming evidence. Everybody does this. You remember the hits, you forget the misses. Uh, let me give you some simple examples of this. For example, uh, let's say you go to the phone to call your friend Bob. Phone rings, it's Bob. Oh my God, it's incredible. Let's just think about calling you. Wow, there must be like some psychic connection thing, some, you know, some synchronicity, the forces connecting us or something like that. Yeah, maybe, but maybe, When's the last time you went to the phone to call your friend Bob and he didn't call? Or he called and you weren't even thinking about him? All the other possibilities that could have happened didn't happen and you forget those. That's the confirmation bias. So this, is, this explains, this goes a long ways to explaining how psychics work, astrologers, tarot card readers, palm readers. We've done a lot on that at Skeptic. It's very popular, especially in Los Angeles. <laughs> psychics abound. Uh, everywhere, palm readers and so on. For five or ten bucks, you can get your palm. All right, so I've gone into these places, the camera crews, and we filmed these. And I've actually set up where I've done psychic readings. And it's not hard, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, even an amateur like me, could, I could make money at this, except I have to look in the mirror in the morning and go, you know what, that's not right. <laughs> okay, how does it work? Well, it, it works in part because of confirmation bias. The people that are going to get the reading will only remember the hits. So they'll throw lots of names out, like, uh, well, I'll give, you, I'll give you sort of generally how it works. First, it starts with a cold reading. You start off very broadly, like, let's say I'm reading you, ma'am. I, I really have a sense about you that you're very intelligent, thoughtful, you have a good sense of humor, and people really like you. <laughs> now, is she going to go, you know, that's just not true. <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm just really not that smart, and I, got no, I'm, I have no sense of humor, and nobody likes it. No, of course not. All right? So this is the, uh, the reading, the general reading that, you know, keep it positive. Everybody thinks that about themselves. Then I can actually do some other tricky stuff, like, now I sense you're, um, that you're, you're sometimes extroverted, like you, you love to go to parties and be with your friends, but other times you're introverted and that you like to be alone. <laughs> 
that pretty much covers everything you could possibly be. So you do these statements that are true you know, for both directions. And then, and then you can get other specific hits by asking a lot of questions. Like, uh, let, let's say I determine you've come to see me because uh, somebody's passed over. Uh, I'm sensing a father figure here. I'm getting a father figure. It could be a father, a grandfather, uncle, friend of the family. And grandfather, yeah, now don't tell me who it is. I'm really getting a sense that it's a grandfather. Um, <laughs> No, no, don't tell me now. So I'm getting a, like an M name. It might, might, be, it might be a Mark or a Michael. It could be. But I'm also getting a G, maybe a George. or a, you know, And you just sort of work your way through the alphabet until she finally tells me. And then they go, no, don't tell me. <laughs> and then you take credit for the hit. And then amazingly afterwards, because these, these readings go on for like an hour, uh, uh, she'll, she'll, afterwards she'll say, that's amazing. He got this and this and this and this and I didn't tell him. It's like. Actually, that's not true. If we play back the video, which we do when we record these things, you go, oh, I told him. I told him when my birthday was. I told him who it was, where I lived, and so on. And then, and then once you get who it is, then you can get the cause of death. There's something about it. He either, he either went fast or he died slowly. I'm, I'm, it's, <laughs> and then she'll blurt out something. Yeah, I say cancer. Don't tell me I'm getting like a cancer, like a lung or brain. I'm getting something about the heart, lungs, or the brain. <laughs> You know, people don't die from, like, I'm getting something about his knee. You know? <laughs> Although a surefire hit is that there's something about a scar on your knee. Do you have a scar on your knee? <laughs> Everybody has a scar on their knee. <laughs> uh, something about a, she's telling me, uh, he's telling me something about a, a red dress. Was there something meaningful about a red dress at some point in your life? or Something about a white car. I'm getting something about a white car. Red dress, white car, almost anybody can find a hit there. Oh, yeah, I had one, or my friend, or my girlfriend or boyfriend or my dad, somebody had a white car and a red dress. And, and you just sort of rifle your way through. Where do these things come from? They come from the Psychic Friends Network book. <laughs> when you sign up to work for Psychic Friends Network, they give you a notebook and it has a list of a bunch of BS statements you make to keep people on the line at $3.99 a minute. It's a scam. How does it appear to work? Confirmation bias. He got this and this and this and this. Well, we've recorded these. I've done several TV shows on these. Uh, we did one for uh, 2020 in which we recorded, I, I recorded over almost 300 comments or questions in a one hour reading, to which the person uh, remembered six hits. Out of 300? Out of the, even including the ones like the scar on the knee, which is gonna be true, so you're gonna get some free hits anyway. All right? So our brains are here to just remember those salient, significant hits. The phone call, the psychic thing, the. But more, more dangerously, if, if I give a group of self-reported um, Democrats or liberals a health care reform bill and say, this was written by a Republican senator, please evaluate. You know, they'll give it like a two on a scale of one to 10. They'll tick off all the errors and problems and why it's no good. And then if I give the same bill to a group of self-reported Republicans or conservatives, they'll go through and go, oh, this is terrific, this is great. Or, even worse, if I give the same bill to that same group of self-reported liberals, Democrats, and say, this was written by a Democratic senator, you know, and, and so on, they'll evaluate it like a 9 out of 10, they'll find almost no mistake. It's the, all the same exact wording. So we're filtering this information through our believing brains, and we're already committed to this over here. This is what I believe. Oh, it's by one of my fellow group members? Well, in that case... Oh, wait a minute, it's by those bastards over there. In that case, I'm going to really pick it apart, right? So, although we like to think we have some access to truth in the real world, which we do to a certain extent, it's limited by the fact that our brains are filtering it through all these preconceived beliefs that we're unaware of that we're doing this. There's a whole host, I have a whole chapter in the book on these um, cognitive biases. Like one is called the anchoring bias. So if I ask you to tell me the last four digits of your social security number, write it down, and then tell me how many restaurants you think there are in New York. Believe it or not, there's a strong correlation between the higher your last four digits of your social security number and the more restaurants you think there are in New York. How weird is that? Is that the dumbest thing you've ever heard? And it's consistently found in subjects. All it is is giving you some number, I'm gonna anchor the number here, and then ask you some Related, unrelated questions, nothing to do with that number, and that'll affect it. Right? This is strange. 
But this is why restaurants, for example, nice restaurants, will have a really expensive bottle of wine, like a $300 bottle of wine. And then they'll have like the $50 bottle of wine, and then the 30, 20, and so on. Maybe 90, 390, 50, and so on. So you're there, and you're looking at it, and you go, oh, look at the 300, that's too high. Oh, it's only, only 90, I'll take the 90, that's nothing. But if it was the 90 and then the 50, you'd go to the 50, right? So they're anchoring you, they're giving you a cognitive bias to push you up, right? So be wary of this when you walk into stores. Your, your brains, th these marketing guys, they are way ahead of the cognitive psychologists. They've been doing this for decades. We're only now just sort of catching up in the lab going, oh, I see, there's a bias. No kidding. We've been pulling that trick on co consumers for decades. <laughs> All right, so, so it operates on that level politically and, of course, uh, in terms of religion. Uh, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's sort of the elephant in the room that we have to talk about because of Islam. If everybody in the world held their own religious beliefs or political beliefs, but talk about religion for a moment, such that the world is big enough that we can all get along and believe separately, that would be fine, no problem. But that isn't how it works. There are too many religions who will not be satisfied until every knee is bowed in honor of their particular religion. We have this sea of religious claims, as wide as the human imagination can be, and the one you believe, the number one predictor of the one you believe is where you happen to have been born in the world and what epoch you happen to have been born in. So had you know, most of us in this room are uh, steeped in the Christian tradition. By the way, as a little pet peeve, politicians are always fond of saying the Judeo-Christian religion because it sort of gives a nod to the Jews. But if you look at Christian literature and writings pre-1900 or so, you would not want to see what they said about Jews. Jews couldn't even get into university, most universities until like the 1950s. So anti-Semitism has been rampant even in this country. Nevertheless, that's just a little side to Judeo-Christian, no. <laughs> that's sort of a, a nod to modern secular values of, of, of treating people more equally, not due to religious sensibilities other than in response to culture. But the problem here then is that where you happen to have been born, had we been born in India, we'd likely believe uh, we'd be Hindu. We'd believe in Ganesha, the blue elephant god, who is said to be omniscient, omnipotent, uh, is God incarnate in flesh, and so on. Or had you been born, uh, say, 3,000, maybe make it 2,500 years ago, you'd believe in one of the Roman gods. Or 3,000 years ago, you'd believe in one of the Egyptian gods. Perhaps Isis, who uh, was born of a virgin, died, was resurrected, came back, and you can have everlasting life if you commit to belief in that God. Does that sound like a familiar theme? That theme predates the Christian theme. This is, a, this is an old tradition. Uh, there are certain themes that repeat constantly throughout history. This is one of them, of virgin births. There's at least a dozen virgin births uh, in, in and around the world in different myths, many of which predate the whole Judeo-Christian story. Or flood myths are very common. There's dozens of them around the world. Resurrection myths, death and, and being brought back to life. Uh, and we take the one we're most used to as the gospel, in this case, literally, <laughs> uh, because that's the one we're used to, we're exposed to, we're raised to believe. Our confirmation bias and all these other cognitive biases tell us that really is the right one. And uh, that's what I believe, too. I was a born-again Christian evangelical. And, through about seven years, and until I, in, in graduate school, I started taking courses in comparative world religions, comparative mythology, and it just sort of got me thinking, what are the chances I happen to have gotten it right, and all these other people, billions of them, who believe something differently than me, they're all wrong. At first I thought, yeah, they are all wrong. Ah, I did get it right, and I started thinking, the more I studied psychology, social psychology, cognitive psychology, like, eh, I don't know, maybe not. Even makes me doubt my own political beliefs. I'm a libertarian. But I know that I consciously read libertarian literature, the Wall Street Journal or Cato Institute, or, with an eye to finding the arguments that best fit what I want to believe. And I make fun of both the liberals and conservatives. They're all a bunch of you know, blowhards and wishy-washy, mamby-pamby bedwetters. And I go through all that in my head, and then I think, yeah, Sturmer, maybe not. What if you're wrong? You know, libertarian, you're not one of those, you know, porn-watching, pot-smoking, you know, we're going to 
we're going to take Texas and go independent and secede from the Union. You, you've heard all these things, right? Okay, those are the nutty libertarians. Okay, well, there's nutty conservatives and there's nutty liberals, right? So the temptation is to, you know, demonize people in these other camps, groups, tribes, whether they're parties or religions or so on. Uh, now the good news, and then I'll take your questions. The good news is that things are getting better. Uh, over the last 500 years or so, there's been a long-term trend of including more and more people into our tribe and becoming more tolerant of people that are not quite like us. They're a little different. And this has been going on for since, really since the Enlightenment, since about the, say, 1650s to 1700s when things have started to pick up. The judicial system is fairer and more just for more people. Races, levels of racism have declined. Levels of rape and how women are treated. Do you, do you know that all the way up until 1900, there wasn't a single democracy in the entire world? Like, wait a minute. Well, by democracy, I mean where everybody can vote. Women couldn't vote in this country until 1920. That's kind of pathetic. But on the other hand, here we are. There are now over 100 liberal democracies in the world. So this is, this is a good sign. I attribute this to a number of different factors. The only one I want to focus is on it here is because this is what I do, science and reason, literature reading. I think the biggest factor, one of the biggest factors, is the fact that more people are literate and read, see movies, watch TV, especially the internet is going to change everything. Because when you see other people, it, it humanizes them. Like, wait a minute. I mean, back when people were anti-Semitic and, and, and racist against uh, blacks and, and other minorities, they didn't even know one. It's like they, they didn't even really see one in person. We now know from social psych research that if you know a gay person, personally know a gay person, you're like 10 times more likely to be in favor of gay marriage simply because you can see, oh, he's just like me. You know, he wants to get married and be miserable, so let him. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you want to get married and not have sex anymore, go ahead and get married, fine. <laughs> really, I really don't understand the gay marriage thing, but while I'm politicizing here, Here's my prediction. The gay marriage thing will be done with and over in 20 to 25 years, and we'll look back on the, 19, the, the, the 2000s and 2010s like we look back now in the 1950s with the black and white drinking fountains. It'll be like that. It'll be like, we didn't let gays get, what, what, what were they thinking back then? I mean, come on, how ridiculous is this? And then the Christians will take credit for it. They'll say, you see, we were always in favor of that. And they'll find some Episcopalian minister who was gay who said, gay should get married. Say, that was our guy. <laughs> so mark my word, this is what will happen. That's fine. I don't care who takes credit for it. I just want liberty and freedoms to be expanded to include everybody, right? Not just the members of our tribe or the, or the ones that you know, we don't like because they're <laughs> different. Right? So, and, and this is, in fact, what has happened with the abolition of slavery. This was a huge, long, centuries-long effort on the part of a lot of different people, some of who were Christian ministers, like uh, uh, Samuel Wilberforce, William Wilberforce, the, the father of Samuel, who led this revolution. He was a Christian. Okay, great. But who was he most opposed by? His fellow religionists, who cited in the Bible, there it is, right there, it says slavery is not only okay, it's good. Nobody would make that argument anymore, right? We've changed. The worldview that we live in is so different now. And in part, it's because the state said, don't do that anymore. And we're sending the troops in to make sure you don't discriminate anymore. That sometimes is what it takes. But more it takes a, sort of a consciousness raising on the part of civil libertarians like Martin Luther King. And more modern today is, I think, the, the last two groups that are being discriminated against, the gays and, and atheists or non-believers. Now, I don't know what you believe and here you are in, I guess this is the Deep South, yes? <laughs> uh, and, and I know these, these feelings run high about people who are gay or don't believe in God. Um, but this too shall change. I mean, there's no evidence that gay people or atheists are less moral or not as good as citizens or they don't fight as well in the military. None, none of that's true. This is what we assume to be true. This is what people think, but it's not true. And uh, any more than it was not true that, that blacks and Jews were not as good a people as, uh, as, as everybody else. So that's the good news, that our brains are malleable enough. They can be manipulated by better ideas. Bad ideas can be replaced with good ideas. 
I mean, people used to burn women alive on the stake because they believed they had been in concert with the devil. What were these people thinking? I mean, this is insane. This is stupid. But they believed that because they lived in a demon-haunted world. We don't live in that world anymore. So, and that's only century, a few centuries ago. Salem witch trials is barely two centuries ago. So the progress can be made. It's not biological. It's not evolution. It's cultural change. Ideas matter. Reason matters. Literature matters. Reading. Exposure to other people. Travel. Travel is a proxy for having a, a more liberal attitude. By liberal, I mean um, tolerant of people that are different from you. Just going overseas to any other foreign country. Oh, they're like me, but a little different. But they're, that's okay. And then they'll make fun of Americans and so on. And that's okay, too. All in good fun. But as long as we, this leads to more tolerance, which it does. So then I end the believing brain with is talking about how we know that anything is true or not. Because I'm kind of constructing it as if there's no truths and that whatever anybody believes at this particular time in history, in this particular place, that's their truth. But there, is an, there actually is a, a, a real truth. There's a reality we can know. And the best tool we have is science because at least it gives us some systematic, reliable methods to try to get at what's real or not. Now, you may be a liberal and I may be a, Demo a conservative or whatever. Okay, we're going to fight over these issues because of that. But we can set that aside and go, okay, yeah, but what does the data actually say? What do the data say? If we had a committee of experts to look at this, can we get past the politics and our religious beliefs? And so on. the answer is, yeah, we can. And this has happened a lot. So I'm encouraged by this, uh, that the spread of scientific thinking, critical thinking, I know critical thinking, your eyes kind of glaze over, right? So, but I just call it skeptical thinking. This is what I do. Uh, you know, skeptic magazine, we're trying to promote skepticism. That is, think about the quality of the evidence. Think about those biases, okay? I, I really, really feel like I'm right. I'm just sure I'm right. Wait a minute, maybe I'm not right. Because I just read that book where it says I could be biased by the anchoring bias and the availability heuristic and the confirmation bias. And I know all those things are working, darn it. Darn it, maybe I actually should talk to somebody else who thinks differently from me. <laughs> and having that exposure to other people, actually go to people and go, you know, I'm, I'm so convinced I'm right, but I have a feeling I might not be, so tell me where I'm going wrong here. Right? This, this is actually part of the game of science. You have to do that or you don't get published. They actually send it to other people who don't even know who you are. Your name is not even on the paper, peer, blind peer review. And they look at it and they just, hopefully, assess it by the ideas alone. It's like the... The American, not the American Idol, but what's the other show where they face the up, they don't look at who it is. Yeah, yeah, that one, right? So there, because we know, actually that's a good idea, because we know from research that judges of, uh, this comes from classical music, and hiring um, people for an orchestra. If you can see who it is, then you're less likely to judge the quality of the playing uh, objectively. Th this first came out when it, when it was obvious it was a woman playing a violin rather than a man. And, they, and the judges, all old white guys, <laughs> always judge the women players as, as uh, less, as, as inferior. Until they were blinded, there was just a, like a screen. And the person was sitting behind the screen, they could not tell the difference between men and women. So it was like, aha! Right? So another bias. So that, but, 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 but being aware of that bias helps us overcome it by setting up conditions in which uh, we, we prevent that from happening. And so in the long run, the solution is, is the spread of ideas, reason, logic, empiricism, science. That's what's going to get us out of most of our social ills today. Thank you.